give you can use. It's a beautiful day. And then about a hundred years ago in 1916 in the United States, Piggly Wiggly opened its first self-service supermarket. Wow. Revolution. You could go in and you could touch the products. You could put what you wanted into your basket. And at that moment, the shopper was born. But this is the moment of true innovation and revolution in grocery, the day we took the counter away. What's interesting about this is that that was 100 years ago. 100 years later, we do the exact same thing that Saunders did in 1916. We have some shelves, we have some aisles, we put some products on the shelves, buy them if you want. So 100 years later, with all our technology, with all our innovation and creativity, we're still doing the exact same thing. How can we understand the shopper in the last three feet? That is the moment that you live or die. All the work you've done up to now, all the new product development, the innovation, the consumer marketing, the TV, all that is pointless unless at that moment they put your product in their basket. It's the last three seconds is what matters. Everything else before, rubbish. And category management in a way is at fault here. Who, how many people here work in category management? Show of hands. So you all sit there with your little colored pencils and you make beautiful pictures of the world on a planogram. And it would be lovely if consumers saw that as their reality, but they don't. They don't see that as their reality. And a category management often can, can kill creativity and can kill uh, our, our understanding of how the shopper actually interacts with the category because we see things from, from, from two bird's eye view. We've coined in our agency something called positive disruption. You need to disrupt your shopper to make sure that they see all the options and you can get the incremental sale in the store and for your brand. But you have to do it positively. You can't do negative disruption because that's going to drive the shopper into the competitor's store. Lots of things happen in store, lots of in-store media. You've got floor stickers, you've got trolley ads, you've got entrance ads. And this is where shopper marketing gets a bit misunderstood. People think that shopper marketing is ads in a store. That's just in-store media. Shopper marketing is behavioral change. And this is the problem with a lot of in-store. In-store isn't actionable. It's just consumer marketing putting a message into the store. You have to be creative. You have to be creative and innovative if you're going to achieve positive disruption. Because if you're not, you simply won't be seen. Why can't we use in-store? Why can't we use emotive messaging to sell? Why do we always use price and promotion to move product off the shelf at half margin to somebody? Why aren't we using the irrational and the emotional to sell? So I'm going to use a five senses model for the, next, for the rest of the presentation to talk about, you know, we have five senses. Why don't we use them all in store? And let's, talk, let's start with visibility. And then here's an example of, of the fish counter in a German store. How do you get people to buy more fresh fish? People forget about fish. So what they've done is they've done a floor projection. They have a little bit of a soundtrack as well of the sea lap, um, lapping waves. But on the floor, they have a projection of fish. And they're interactive. Obviously, kids obviously love it. Um, and the great thing about these floor projections today is that they're fully interactive. So you can step on them and the fish change and they move. And you've seen these in airports and you've seen them around, I'm sure. So this technology is very, very cheap. It's nothing different to the technology we're using today to show the slides. So the idea of, of having interactive stuff in store and building the experience for a brand or for a category is really important. And I'll let you in on a little secret. Men and women buy chocolate in very different ways. This is a man buying chocolate. I'd like some chocolate. I'll buy this bar of chocolate. Thank you very much. This is a woman buying chocolate. Oh, there's the chocolate. No, I won't. And then she moves slowly up the queue towards the chocolate and she looks again, no, no. And at the last minute, her body will disobey her independently of her brain. And it's a wonderful moment because often the eye tracking doesn't even see their own hand. Their own hand moves independently to their body and it's always the last item put on just when the till is about to be closed. And they go, oh, how did that get there? <laughs> we also have automated technology these days that allows us to track people as they shop and, and to look at their facial recognition. We use this software. This is an example, for instance, that we put into adult magazines. So just for a joke, we put the camera into adult magazines. This camera is the size of the button on my shirt. And the software is doing it, saying, how long are you looking at me? Are you a male or female? And what age you are? 
So at the end, if you have two pieces of stimulus that you're going to send out into your grocery stores, you can decide, well, which one will we we'll test them both in a few stores, and we'll work out, well, version A gets 50% more visibility than version B, so we'll launch version A. So these guys are all looking at adult magazines. And I like this as an example, because imagine standing outside the store and saying, hello, sir, did you have a sneaky look at the adult magazines today while you were in the store? Yes? No? Obviously, your study would tell you that 100% of people do not look at the adult magazines. Bon uh, always cite their store in a shopping mall on a corner site so that the scent goes in both directions because they're not stupid and they know that you'll smell the store long before you see it and you buy. So scent marketing is big and now we see it used in outdoor advertising even. Here's an example of a bus shelter where you pushed the potato, and the potato heated up and then it gave out a jet of, of fresh baked potato. Now that's just cruel when you're at six o'clock and you're commuting home and you're hungry. But that's the point. The big revolution in scent marketing came when we launched point of purchase scent marketing. So now the technology is so cheap, any shelf wobbler or any piece of point of sale can be scent enabled for about three weeks, which is the average cycle of a promotion in a grocery store. So now we can have, at, at if any non-food, any uh, skin care, it makes obvious sense, but even for coffee and for chocolate, we can start to bring the sense of scent into the store. And let me show you a funny exa example of how this works again. And let's go back to chocolate. In the supermarkets, confectionery also has the same problem because you've got mum usually pushing the trolley and she comes to the top of the aisle and she looks down the aisle and she sees all the chocolate and she's thinking two things. One, she's thinking I shouldn't buy that for my children, it's full of sugar. And two, if I buy it, I'll eat it all. So she tends to avoid the aisles. Um, Sound is another one that's used extensively outside of our industry, but for some reason we're not great at it. So there's a great study in, in wine shops that shows that when you change the soundtrack playing in the store from popular radio or pop to classical or opera, your wine sales will remain the same from a volume perspective, but will go up by 25 to 30 percent. Now what's happening there? Well, you all know what's happening, don't you? You're standing in the off-license and Pavarotti is playing in the background and suddenly you're a wine expert. And you're like, yes, I, I was going to buy the 8 euro bottle, but now I'll buy the 15 euro bottle. Oh, yes, a Merlot. Uh, I haven't a clue what I'm drinking, but it sounds fantastic. So you, you get, you know, emotionally you're more involved. Similarly, there was a study done in florist shops where they changed the soundtrack to romantic music. It had no effect on women, but men paid 30% more for their flowers because men are stupid. So they play birdsong in their fragrance department because when women are pampering themselves in a spa and it's all about me, I'm lying down, I've got my towel on, that's the soundtrack, birdsong, relaxed. So when you play the same soundtrack in the perfumery, they're walking through thinking, oh yeah, I should treat myself. And suddenly you're stopping and you're buying a 50 euro jar per or bottle of perfume. Harrods do the same in swimwear. Around April time, they have the sound of lapping waves on a beach in their swimwear department, combined with scent marketing of coconut. So now you're walking through, it's March, it's April, it's freezing outside, and you're buying a bikini. And this is the point, no price promotion. You just engage the shopper in a way, you positively disrupt them, you give them an experience, and you sell bananas that are fair trade bananas. It's the same as a regular banana. But you charge a dollar more. And they, they, yeah, the voice taught me to buy the bananas. You give them an experience. The retailers in the store will do this, the functional message. You buy cheese, you buy burgers, you get a deal, functional. Where, of course, if they were clever and they were doing a bit of this in the store, then you think, oh, okay. And then even better again, you might add the smell of charcoal with some point of purchase scent marketing. Now it's Thursday and I'm thinking, oh, I smell barbecue and I hear the sizzle and this weekend the sun might appear. So again, you're planting the aspirational seed. Shoppers love to taste products. Would you buy a pair of jeans without fitting them? No, you wouldn't. So why do you expect your shopper to buy your product without tasting it? You know, it's, the, it's important. And Cadbury, the Cadbury's chocolate brand in Ireland did a lovely use of digital marketing uh, last year where they launched a Share a Square app. You downloaded the free app to your phone. It was a virtual bar of chocolate. You broke a square off and you sent it, sent it to a friend on Facebook. They got the square of chocolate and thought, what's this? They downloaded the app and they sent you a square back. When you had eight squares of virtual chocolate, that's only eight friends. Please tell me you've got eight friends. You got your chocolate bar. Now, it was only a virtual chocolate bar, but the minute you got eight squares, it converted to a QR code, which meant you went to your local convenience store with your phone, they scanned it, and you got your free bar of chocolate. 
So they did two things. They got, did a bit of fun with, the, with their target market, but they drove traffic to the store, and the store was delighted, because when you came to the store, you probably bought some other things anyway as well. But they used the store as their sampling point, drove thou tens of thousands of people to the store, they sampled tens of thousands of bars of chocolate in a far cheaper way, and that's good use of digital and social apps and Facebook, as opposed to be my friend on Facebook, please. So now you, you approach the window, and you can interact with the window. So you can actually buy all, so the store is closed, but you can actually buy using the window. You can just slide the window and you can t decide what clothes you want and off you go. So it's fully interactive. Uh, so here's the new, the new uh, transparent smart window again from Samsung. My so this is a screen, it, is but it's a Samsung window. It's just a window you can use as a screen. So we're going to see like more and more of this in retail, where you, it can be a, a, a full like image screen playing an image, or it can go opaque and it can be see-through. So, uh, so it can be wine. fully flexible. We're going to see the shop window and in fact, in even in grocery, the aisle ends start to become far more interactive. And here's Kraft's version of that. I'm not going to spend much time on it. Again, this is their kiosk. This is designed to be in a store, where again, you go through some menu options maybe. You choose a recipe that you like. And we see a few things coming together in this one. This is touch screen, obviously, but he's selected a kind of a snacking recipe. So he presses Oreo cookies because it's part of the recipe, and out pops an Oreo cookie for him to sample. So now we've got automated taste sampling, mixing in with touch. It's also got facial recognition for later on. So you know we're seeing a lot of interactivity. And but I guess for retail, what's really interesting about NFC, at the current moment, we don't know who you are until you leave our store when you're paying with your credit card or when you're paying with your loyalty card at the very end, that's when we know who you are, but it's too late. You're about to leave. We'd really like to know who you are as you enter the store. And that's what NFC will give us. I mean, Nordstrom are doing it in the, in the US at the moment, tracking Wi-Fi Mac addresses with phones. So the moment you walk in, they know who you are again. They know you're back because they're, they're tracking, they're pulling the Wi-Fi feed from your phone. So NFC is going to make that, uh, enable it for the full grocery industry. And why are we doing the same thing in the center aisles? Why aren't we using all this technology that we have, all these creative minds in this room, all this innovation that we could be using? Why do we expect shoppers to buy our brand off the shelf randomly? Why aren't we giving them just that little bit of a nudge? And this is one, one saying I, kinda li I like to drive through retailer and supplier clients, because if you continue to do what you have always done, at best, and I mean at best, you can expect to sell what you've just always sold. If you're looking for growth and if you're looking for double-digit growth, you need to obviously step outside the box and get a bit more creative. Um.